Did you know that a single event led to the deaths of millions? The real reason World War I started is way more complicated than you think, and I'm about to break it down for you. The world of 1914 was the age of modern technology, culture, and fashion. Truly the height of civilization. Let's have a war. Everyone knows that a big war is about to happen. France wants to take back some of what Germany took from them. Germany wants to take more of everyone's stuff, and they are building a big, sexy navy that's making the British uncomfortable. These two empires thought they were great, but many people who lived there didn't think it was all that great. And some of them even declared independence with the help of Russia. People were talking behind each other's backs, pointing out that military technology had come a long way since the last great war, and suddenly everyone was pretty eager to fight each other. In this part of Austria-Hungary, there were Serbs and Bosnians who hated living in Austria-Hungary. So the Archduke of Austria-Hungary Franz Ferdinand went there for a pleasure trip in an open-top car, with his car's route announced in advance. And everything went as expected. The assassins were waiting for him on the road and threw bombs at his car, but they missed and blew up the officers behind him. So the crown prince escaped, left Sarajevo and the whole war never happened. Except no, the Archduke did not leave but returned in an open car to visit the wounded officers in the hospital. The driver took a wrong turn and, by pure coincidence, found himself trapped next to one of the failed assassins who shot him. Austria-Hungary was understandably angry about all this, and they assumed that the Serbian government had something to do with it, which was possible. So they went to their German ally and said, hey Germany, we're going to declare war on Serbia and Germany is ready to do anything. Austria-Hungary therefore sent a long list of impossible demands to Serbia, and when Serbia refused, it declared war. Austria-Hungary and Germany were friends, and Serbia was protected by Russia, which was friendly with France, so they declared war on each other. Montenegro joined them. France and England also have a kind of alliance, so when France says, hey England, are you with me? England says, maybe. Then they decided to stay out of it, which was good for Germany because Germany had a plan. They know that Russia is so big and clumsy that it will take them a while to prepare for war. Germany sent all their troops to France at a fast pace under this man's leadership, followed by Russia defeating them and speaking German while eating pepper pot fast every day. There was just one problem. France had a lot of forts and defenses along the German border and Germany couldn't waste time fighting them, so Germany decided to bypass them, going through Belgium. Belgium was neutral, but Germany wanted to send 750,000 soldiers there to overcome the French defenses. They hoped Belgium would sit down and be quiet, but they didn't. They fought back and they were pretty good at it too, so they slowed down the Germans. The worst part was that Britain was coming, and they were pretty angry that Germany was invading neutral countries, so now Britain declared war on Germany. So the Germans continued their journey through Belgium, committing some atrocities along the way. They also wore spikes and sometimes skulls on their uniforms, so if you were trying not to look like a bad guy, all the better. The Allies had wild propaganda, and it was starting to have an impact around the world, especially in America. President Woodrow Wilson saw himself as some kind of Jesus Christ figure and spent much of the war trying to get people to hug each other. But there was also a large ethnic German population in the United States, and when the war broke out they were like, yay, Germany, but now that they were committing atrocities in Belgium, let's play find the French soldier. Have you seen him yet? Easy, right? He wore a bright blue uniform with red pants. And do you know who else was easy to spot? The Germans. So as the French marched slowly in columns through the countryside, the Germans easily tore them to pieces with their huge cannons. Every nation involved in this war is entering with an old-fashioned war mentality. And all must update their uniforms and tactics for the Great War. Because this war will be like nothing anyone has ever seen before. Russia is ready for war and much sooner than expected. Hey, Austria-Hungary, can you handle it? Oh yes, of course we have that. No. As a result, Germany had to send troops back east to defend against the Russians. The Austro-Hungarian army's chief of staff was this guy, who, although handsome, turned out not to be the best military strategist. Austria-Hungary constantly ignored German advice and ran back to Germany whenever they were in trouble. Austria-Hungary even got a kick in the rear by tiny Serbia, 
which repelled all their invasion attempts at the start of the war. However, it was better news for Germany in the north, where it almost destroyed the Russian Second Army. Back on the Western Front, the Germans continued to advance and were now within sight of Paris. At this point, anyone could be forgiven for thinking that the Germans would finally achieve this quick victory, but then things began to go wrong. The French commander-in-chief knew something had to be done and he ordered his troops to stop retreating. In the resulting battle, a hole opened in the German lines. If a gap opened up, the enemy could exploit it to attack you from the sides and rear, so the Germans had to retreat. The Allies counterattacked, and the Germans dug in their defensive positions. The Allies did the same. Then both sides moved north, trying to flank each other as they went. When they reached the sea, they found themselves at a stalemate, with trenches stretching from the coast to Switzerland, the beginning of trench warfare on the Western Front. This is how trench warfare works. Two trenches face each other, with no land between them. Each side bombards the other with hundreds of thousands of artillery shells, sometimes for days. This has a huge psychological impact on the soldiers, leaving many of them in shock. The attacking troops then leave the trenches and charge across a no-man's land, a patchwork of shell craters and wet, muddy barbed wire. The defensive trenches opened fire on the attackers, causing thousands of casualties. The attackers sent wave after wave until they gave up or the enemy trenches were finally overrun. There will be months of fighting and the deaths of thousands to gain a few meters or kilometers of land. Living in the trenches is also hard work. Corpses, mud that can swallow people whole, toxic puddles, rats, diseases, and bad smells. It made no sense for millions of soldiers to endure these conditions and had been ordered to do so by their commanders for years. While both sides were locked in a difficult stalemate, they knew that this war would not be about gaining territory but simply about wearing each other out. The Allies had plenty of troops to spend in their overseas territories. The British had also begun a naval blockade so Germany could not import products, such as food. Neither side wanted a long and tiring war, so both sides thought of ways to break the stalemate on the Western Front. Idea number one is new frontiers. When the war broke out, Australia quickly occupied German New Guinea. The Allies also quickly attacked German colonies in Africa, especially in German East Africa. The local population was forced into service by both sides as soldiers and porters, leading to the tragic loss of life for the native African people. New fighters also joined the fight. New allies and friends were Italy and Japan. Japan was busy building its empire, so the capture of German islands and colonies in East Asia was more than welcome. Italy had been allied with Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war, but after relations had strained and the Allies promised to give them some of Austria-Hungary's possessions, they switched sides. Italy opened a front in the mountains here, but like everyone else, remained deadlocked for most of the war. The Central Power's new friend was a struggling empire in the Middle East. The Ottomans were divided on whether they should join the war, exhausted by the recent Balkan Wars. Some politicians who wanted to join the army went off on their own and fired a few shots at Russia, then came back and said, oh, it looks like we're at war. The Ottomans' entry into the war made the British particularly nervous because the Middle East was full of oil and Britain wanted all that oil. First, the Ottomans tried to attack Russia in the Caucasus Mountains, but they were unprepared for the cold, and many of them died of exposure. Then they crossed miles of desert to capture the Suez Canal from the British, but that also failed. Then the Allies tried to capture the Dardanelles at Gallipoli in a long and arduous campaign of trench warfare, but that also failed. The Ottomans blamed their initial losses on the Armenians living on their territory, and the resulting Armenian genocide resulted in the deaths of one and a half million people. The Germans then sent spies into Afghanistan to try to persuade the Arab tribes to rise in holy war against the British and attack India. But this plan failed, partly because the spies became bored, self-made and drunk, which was bad business in Afghanistan. All these new frontiers did little to change the course of the war. Aware that the Allies had more men and supplies than they did, the Germans knew they had to do something to break the stalemate. Before the war, there was a big conference that established the rules of modern warfare. No chemical weapons, no killing of civilians, don't be stupid. The Germans got together and decided to be stupid. Zeppelin air raids began on British cities. They also began attacking Allied trenches with chlorine gas and using submarines to sink civilian ships. 
One of these civilian ships was the Lusitania, which had 159 Americans on board when it was sunk, which further shook American opinion against the Germans. Not entirely unfair to the Germans, the Allies soon engaged in chemical warfare as well, and they hid anti-submarine weapons on their civilian ships, which allowed the Germans to justify their attacks. Meanwhile, Austria-Hungary had not yet dealt with Serbia, so the Central Powers called for help. Bulgaria wanted to become bigger but was still bitter about losing the Second Balkan War. The Central Powers promised to make all of Bulgaria's wildest dreams come true if they helped, so they agreed and together they eliminated Serbia. The Serbian army retreated through Albania, which was neutral but had ties to Austria-Hungary. So Austria-Hungary entered Albania in a friendly invasion to expel the Serbs, many of whom escaped by sea. It was 1916 and a lot was happening. As if Germany didn't have enough enemies, they added another to the list. Portugal was moving closer to the Allies behind the scenes, and Germany didn't like that at all. Around this time, the only naval battle of the war took place. Both sides had a powerful new class of battleship, the Dreadnought, but they were so expensive to build that neither side wanted to risk losing them in battle. So they kept them in port, unless they had a major battle and many of them were damaged so they didn't try again. The UK had started recruiting men into the army so they had plenty of reserves, which was a good thing because the Western Front was about to get brutal. The longest and bloodiest battle of the war began when the Germans launched an offensive around the French town of Verdun. The French defended it recklessly, suffering hundreds of thousands of casualties. Under pressure, the French called on their allies to do something to distract the Germans, so the British began their own long and brutal battle the Battle of the Somme, with 60,000 British casualties on the first day alone. This was also where the British first used some crazy new science fiction technology. The Russians were pushed deeper and deeper into their territory, but in response to a French call for help, they launched a massive offensive and did very well until they ran out of supplies and found themselves trapped. Seeing how well the Russians were doing, Romania decided that this would be the perfect time to intervene and win the war, but they were defeated. The Greeks were arguing among themselves about whether to enter the war. The king had no central authority, while the vizier wanted an alliance. After a brief period of division, which left the country in two, the king finally abdicated and the country was reunited. With the help of their allies, they launched a new offensive. In the Middle East, Russia advanced into Ottoman territory from the north. The British also landed in Mesopotamia to protect the Persian oil fields and also sent a small army across the Tigris to try to take Baghdad, but this army was besieged in the city. From Kut along the way and eventually surrendered, a new offensive was launched from the south with an all-out war in the desert. The attack was supported by a famous British officer, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, who helped lead Arab tribes in a revolt that devastated the Ottoman supply lines. As 1917 wore on, everyone was exhausted. The French army mutinied, the German population starved, and the war had exhausted all of Russia's supplies. There was no clear winner and it was still a people's war. The only question now was who would break first. And the answer was Russia. Tired of not eating and angry that a homeless madman was making decisions, an uprising broke out in Petrograd with riots and strikes. The riots grew into a full-scale revolution and a new government overthrew the Tsar. A few months later, the Bolsheviks overthrew the new government and withdrew Russia from the war. This was great news for Germany, which had to concentrate on the Western Front. But there was still a problem. The United States seemed to be getting closer and closer to entering the war. The United States had been selling supplies to the Allies throughout the war and had become rich doing so, which meant that it was in good and dangerous shape for the Germans. So Germany sent a telegram to Mexico saying, wouldn't it be great if you attacked America? But the British intercepted the message and showed it to the Americans, and that was the final straw. American troops began arriving in Europe. This was terrible news for Germany, and they knew that their only hope now was to force France and Great Britain to surrender before new American troops arrived. It was now or never, so they launched their final attack. They rallied their troops and attacked the Somme hard, simultaneously pushing back the Allies. They attacked a second time further north, then again and again. With each attack, the Germans expended more and more resources, while the Allies became better and better at repelling their attacks. By the fifth attack, the Allies held the line, even being pushed back. With the Americans arriving in greater numbers, the Allies launched a counterattack, 
And that was that. The Central Powers are being pushed back on all fronts. Bulgaria fell first, followed by the Ottoman Empire, then Austria-Hungary, and finally, on November 11, 1918, at 11 a.m., Germany surrendered. In the peace treaty, Germany was forced to reduce its army, accept responsibility for the war, and pay its costs. After unspeakable suffering and millions of deaths, the world learned its lesson and has never experienced such a terrible war again. For about 20 years, 